What about eukaryotic versus prokaryotic cells, prokaryotes? What, how big, what, what are each of those and how big of an invention is that? I personally think that's the single biggest invention in the whole history of life. That's exciting. <laughs> so what, what are they? Can you explain? Yeah, so, so, so I, I mentioned bacteria and archaea. These are both prokaryotes. Um, they're basically small cells that don't have a nucleus. If you look at them under a microscope, you don't see much going on. If you look at them under a super resolution microscope, then they're fantastically complex. Uh, in terms of their molecular machinery, they're amazing. In terms of their morphological appearance under a microscope, they're really small um, and, and really simple. The earliest life that we can physically see on the planet are stromatolites, which are made by things like cyanobacteria, and they're, they're large superstructures, effectively biofilms plated on top of each other, uh, and, and you end up with quite quite large structures that you can see in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. But they they don't... They never came up with animals. They never came up with plants. They, they came up with multicellular things, filamentous cyanobacteria, for example. They're just long you know, strings of cells. But the, the origin of the eukaryotic cell seems to have been what's called an endosymbiosis. So one cell gets inside another cell. Uh, and I think that that transformed the energetic possibilities of life. So what we end up with is a kind of a supercharged cell which can have a much larger nucleus with m many more genes, all supported. If you think about it, you, you could think about it as, a, as multibacterial power without the overhead. So you've got, a, you've got a cell and it's got bacteria living in it, and those bacteria are providing it with the energy currency it needs. But each bacterium has a genome of its own, which costs a fair amount of energy to, to, to express, to, uh, to kind of turn over and convert into proteins and so on. What the mitochondria did, which are these power packs in our own cells. They were bacteria once, and they threw away virtually all their genes. They've only got a few left. So mitochondria is, like you said, is the bacteria that got inside a cell yeah. and then threw away all this stuff it doesn't need to survive inside the cell and then kept what? So what we end up with, so it kept always a handful of genes. In our own case, 37 genes. Um, but there's a, there's a few protists, which are single-celled things that have got as many as 70 or 80 genes. So they, it's, it's not always the same, but it's always a small number. Um, and you can think of it as a pared down power pack where, where the control unit has really been, has been uh, kind of pared down to almost nothing. So you're putting out the same power, but the, the investment in, in the overheads is really pared down. That means that you can support a much larger nuclear genome. So we've gone up in the number of genes, but also the, the amount of power you have to convert those genes into proteins. We've gone up about fourfold in the number of genes, but in terms of the, the size of genomes and your ability to, to, to make the building blocks, make the proteins, we've gone up 100,000 fold or more. So it's a huge step change in the possibilities of evolution. Um, and and it is, it's interesting then that the only, the only two occasions that complex life has arisen on Earth, plants and animals, mm -hmm. uh, fungi you could say are, are, are complex as well, but they don't form such complex morphology as, as plants and animals. Start with a single cell. They start with an oocyte and a sperm fused together to make a zygote. So you start development with a single cell, and all the cells in the organism have identical DNA. And you switch off in the, in the brain. You switch off these genes, and you switch on those genes. And the liver, you switch off those, and you switch on a different set. And the standard evolutionary explanation for that is that you've, you, you're restricting conflict. You don't have a load of genetically different cells that are all fighting each other. Um, and, and so it, it works. The trouble with bacteria is they form these biofilms and they're all genetically different and, and effectively they're incapable of that level of cooperation. Uh, they would get in a fight. Okay, so uh, why is this such a difficult invention of getting this bacteria inside and becoming an engine, which the mitochondria is? What, why was that? Why, why do you assign it such great importance? Is it great importance in terms of the difficulty of how it was to achieve, or great importance in terms of the impact it had on life? Both. Uh, it had a huge impact on life because if if that had not happened, you can be certain that life on Earth would be bacterial only. And it that took be, a really long time to. It took two billion years. Yeah. And it hasn't happened since, to the best of our knowledge. So it looks as if it's genuinely difficult. And if you think about it then from, from, from just an informational perspective, you, you think bacteria have got, they, they, they structure their information differently. 
So a bacterial cell has a small genome. It might have 4,000 genes in it, but a single E. coli cell has access to about 30,000 genes, potentially. It's got a kind of metagenome where other E. coli out there have got different gene sets and they can switch them around between themselves. Uh, and so you can generate a huge amount of variation. And you know they've got more, ge- an E. coli metagenome is larger than the human genome. We own 20,000 genes or something. So, and they've had 4 billion years of evolution to work out what can I do and what can't I do with this metagenome. And the answer is you're stuck. You're still bacteria. So they have explored genetic sequence space far more thoroughly than eukaryotes ever did because they've had twice as long at least and they've, they've, they've got much larger populations. And they never, they never got around this problem. So why can't they? It seems as if you can't solve it with information alone. So what's the, what's, what's the problem? The problem is structure. If, if, if cells, if the very first cells needed an electrical charge on their membrane to grow, and in bacteria, it's, this, it's the outer membrane that surrounds the cell, which is electrically charged. You try and scale that up and you've got a fundamental design problem. You've got an engineering problem. And th- there are examples of it. And, and what we see in all these cases is what's known as extreme polyploidy, which is to say they have tens of thousands of copies of their complete genome, which is you know, energetically hugely expensive. And a, you, know, a, you, know, it, it, you end up with a large bacteria with no further development. What you need is to in- incorporate these electrically charged power pack units inside with their control units intact uh, and for them not to conflict so much with the host cell that that it all goes wrong. Perhaps it goes wrong more often than not. And then you change the topology of the cell. Now, you don't necessarily have any more DNA than a giant bacterium with extreme polyploidy, but what you've got is an asymmetry. You now have a giant nuclear genome surrounded by lots of subsidiary energetic genomes that do do all the and they're the control units that are doing all the, all the all the all the all the control of energy generation could this have been done gradually or does it have to be done the, the power pack has to be all intact and ready to go and uh work i mean it's a kind of step change in the possibilities of evolution but it doesn't happen overnight it's going to still require multiple multiple generations so it could take you know it could take millions of years it could take shorter time. This is another thing I would like to put the number of steps and try and work out what's required at each step. And we, we are trying to do that with sex, for example. You can't have a very large genome unless you have sex at that point. So what are the changes to go from bacterial recombination to eukaryotic recombination? What, what, what do you need to do? Why do we go from passing around bits of DNA as if it's loose change to fusing cells together, lining up the chromosomes, recombining across the chromosomes, and then going through two rounds of cell division to produce your, your gametes. All eukaryotes do it that way. So again, you know, why switch? What are the drivers here? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of evolution, but as soon as you've got cells living inside another cell, what you've got is a, is a, is a new design. You, you've, you've got new potential that you didn't have before. So the... Cell living inside another cell, that design allows for better storage of information, better use of energy, uh, more delegation, like a hierarchical control of the whole thing. And then and then somehow that leads to ability to have multi-cell organisms. I'm not sure that you have hierarchical control necessarily, but you, you, you've got a system where you can, you can have a, a, a much larger information storage depot in the nucleus. You can have a much larger genome. And that allows multicellularity, yes, because um, it allows you it's – it's a funny thing, but you, to, to have, a, to have a, 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 an animal where I have you know, 70% of my genes switched on in my brain and a different 50% switched on in my liver or something, you've got to have all those genes in the egg cell at the very beginning. And you've got to have a, a, a program of development which says, okay, you guys switch off those genes and switch on those genes and you guys, you do that. Mm-hmm. But all the genes are there at the beginning. That means you've got to have a lot of genes in one cell and you've got to be able to maintain them. And the problem with bacteria is they don't get close to having enough genes in one cell. So they would, if you were to try and make a multicellular organism from bacteria, you'd bring different types of bacteria together and hope they'll cooperate. And the reality is they don't. That's really, really tough to do. Yeah. Coming into we know they don't because it doesn't exist. We have the data, as far as we know. I'm sure there's a few like special ones and they do off quickly. I'd love to know some of the most fun things bacteria have done since. 
Oh, like, there's a f- I mean, they can do some pretty funky things. And this is big. <laughs> this is broad brushstroke that I'm talking about. Yes. But it-